Now for tonight's story. Let's go beyond tomorrow. Are you afraid to face tomorrow? Or whatever may lie beyond tomorrow? Do you think you're up to spending a weekend on the moon? Or entertaining house guests from Mars? Can you and your children adjust to the strange, new, wonderful world that is being wrought in the test tubes and cyclotrons of science beyond tomorrow? Beyond Tomorrow, a new program of probabilities drawn from the vast library of science fiction where anything is possible and possibly may happen to you. Tonight, based on a famous story by Theodore Sturgeon and adapted by Draper Lewis, a tale about a man accused of murder in a small western town who insists it was not murder, but something really much worse. All right, all right! I'm presiding coroner here, and I'll handle this inquest my way, if you don't mind. All right. Now, look, Kemp, why can't you get it through your head that nobody's trying to railroad you into admitting anything? You're just a fella knows something about the death of this here Alessandro Sykes. And this court would like to know exactly what happened. Well, I'll tell you what happened. That kid killed Sykes, killed him dead in the doornail, and then brought the body back here and dumped it in his hotel room. That's what happened. Yes, sir. Sir. No. No, you're wrong. I didn't kill him. I didn't kill him. You're trying to accuse me of murder, but I tell you, it's something worse. Something much, much worse than murder. If we don't have it quiet in this courtroom, I'm going to have the sheriff clear the place. Uh, you know, this inquest is going to be run legal like or ain't going to be run at all. You mean maybe we should have the hanging right now, Bert? I didn't say no such thing. Well, maybe you should and stop wasting so much time. Well, that's fine. Yeah. Mr. Wilson, Mr. Wilson, sir, you can't let him hang me. I'm innocent, I tell you. I didn't kill Sykes. Aren't you even going to listen to what I got to say? Sure. Sure, son, I'm going to listen. Yeah, We're oh, all right. going to listen. Or I'm taking this boy into Tucson where there's a jury that will listen. Well, this better be good. We don't like murder around switchpath. No, and we don't like strangers neither. If you gentlemen are through now, suppose we hear what the boy has to say. All right, son. Now, let's get the facts straight first off. Your full name. James Gordon Kemp. And your home? Chicago. Chicago, Illinois. <laughs> City bred, huh? Maybe that's why he don't give no mind to something like murder. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you was always so proud about the times you've been to Tucson, Hafferty. Huh? Seems to me wearing silk shirts is pretty city fied, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here, son. Sit down. Thank you. Now, suppose you tell us what happened. Tell us the whole story just like it happened. Okay. I'll... I'll try. I guess I'd better go right back to the beginning. The first time I ever saw this here Sykes. It must have been about two months ago. I had a little repair shop at the time, just auto parts and... Maybe fooling around with radios and TV sets now and then. It didn't make no big profit, but it paid the rent and gave me a little extra pocket money. I was working in my shop one afternoon when he walked in. He watched what I was doing a couple of minutes. Then he spoke up. You Gordon Kemp? I said yes and looked him over. He was a scrawny fellow, probably 60 years old, and wound up real tight... He talked fast, smoked fast, moved fast, as if there wasn't time for anything, but he had to get on to something else. I asked him what he wanted. You know, the man had that article in the magazine about a concentrated atomic torch? <laughs> yeah, only that guy from the magazine used a lot of loose talk. He says my torch is 300 years ahead of its time. 
Actually, it's something I stumbled on by accident, more or less. It's an ordinary atomic hydrogen torch, but it's plenty hot. It'll cut anything, anything. And since it got patented, you'd be surprised at the calls I got. You got no idea how many people want to cut into bank vaults in the side doors of hot shops. I'd like to take a few weeks off and go out west. Arizona? I want you to cut your way into a cave there. A cave? Is it legal? Oh, sure it's legal. How legal? You get me into that place, you can satisfy yourself as to whether it's legal. I'll give you $5,000. What? Cash. How's that again? Get me into that cave, and you'll get $5,000. Cash. you happen to run across this here cave, Professor Sykes? Didn't anyone else in Switch Path ever spot it? Yeah, from what I can gather, there must have been a shifting of rock. Maybe a slight earth tremor that opened it up. At the time I was fresh out of college, spending all my time digging for Indian ruins, I found it at the bottom of a deep cleft. A small, dark room, all rock walls. It was rock that was very old. A couple of hundred thousand years. Maybe half a million half million. It wasn't the rock that got me so excited. It wasn't the rock and it wasn't the cave. It was the machinery in the cave. But... Machinery that must have been put there before there were any human beings on Earth. Oh, not just a minute, Professor. Now, look. The... I don't care whether you believe me or not. I know what I'm talking about. Those machines were installed in that cave room back when there wasn't a single living creature of any sort. But, but that doesn't make sense. If there are machines, then some human beings must have made them. Some human beings must have hauled them into the cave and assembled them. Only you say there, there weren't any human beings on Earth. Maybe not on Earth, Kemp. But there are human beings someplace else. At least beings. Who knows whether they're human or not. Well, that's a nice pleasant thought. Yes. I thought so too at the time. I've gotten used to it now. I got used to it during all the days and nights I stayed in that room and studied that machinery. What... what kind of machinery was it? Well, I finally figured out that one of them was some sort of a radio transmitter. Now, get this. Here's a machine with an antenna on top of it, just like a microwave job. Beside it is another machine. The second machine is shaped like a dumbbell standing on one end. Top of it is sort of a covered hopper. At the waist of the machine are two big spools with a wire running between them made out of some alloy that was never seen before on this earth. Were, were they running? One was running, making a slight humming sound. The dumbbell machine was running, and that's what gave me a clue to what it was. That machine is a recorder. And that automatically makes the other machine a transmitter. A recorder? What kind of a recorder? It records the physical being of the entire earth. Every earthquake, every continental shift, weather cycles, every hurricane and volcano eruption and landslide. Now here, take a look at this. Piece of wire, huh? About 35 gauge. Money tough. Yes. I cut it off the recording machine. Kemp, my boy, it took a long time, a lot of years out of my life. I finally got it decoded. I can read that wire. You've no idea in what detail that piece of wire records, second by second, minute by minute, day by day, through the years, through the centuries. When I start my decoding, I'll be able to prove things which until now have only been guessed, only whispered about in the history books of the world. I'll be able to give the exact time and date when the Red Sea parted for the fleeing Israelites. You want to know what happened to the Spanish Armada? I have it all here. What about the last days of Pompeii? I have it, son. I have it. And I am going to give it to the world. Me, Alessandro Sykes, will give it to humanity complete and provable, and history will be reckoned from the day I speak. I admit he did sound a little off his rocker. And if I had any sense, I would have gotten off that train and gone back to Chicago. But he was such a nice little guy. As nice a little character as you'd ever want to meet. 
And he figured he had something, something big in that cave. Yeah, well, I'm not going to listen to Yes, him yes, I tell you, something important enough oh, that he'd been living with it, thinking about it, working on it day in and day out for 30 years or more. You can't look that kind of a guy down. All of us here knew Sykes pretty well, Camp. His family was among the first settlers in Switchpath. Came in on a wagon train just before the rush in 49. We knew he spent a lot of time digging around in the desert, but uh, we never heard about no cave. It's 30 miles or so to the east of town. You pass a big rock formation that's shaped like a crescent. And the cave's a little further I've off. been out by Crescent Rock more times than I can count, and I never see no cave. But you wouldn't see it if you didn't climb into the cleft. Something happened out there just about two years ago. Ground was hot for miles around. All the grass shriveled up and died. Nothing's grown there since. Yeah, besides, if Sykes had found a cave, he certainly would have told somebody here in town. Ain't like he was an outsider, if you know what I mean. Uh, we're sure. That cave was there. It's not there now, but it was there, and I was in it. Sykes didn't tell anyone else about it because he knew no one would believe him. He wanted to get his proof first. And what makes you think we believe you, Kemp? This is the truth, I'm telling you. This is how it happened. And you still haven't told us about the killing yet. No, how about that? I uh, said this inquest was going to be run legal now, boys. I say we're wasting a lot of time. The whole story smells to high heaven, and you know it. Uh, I ain't I, passing I, I, judgment one way or the other till I hear what the boy has to what's say. The idea? And I still mean what I said about having the court clear. All right. Now, go on, Kemp. What happened when you got here to switch path with Sykes? I... I don't think anyone will remember the night we arrived. I was dead tired from the trip, and I... I wanted to get some sleep. But the professor was all for getting out of town as quick as possible. He didn't want to answer any questions. So we piled all the stuff into his rattly old car and started for Crescent Rock. It was plenty spooky driving across the desert at night. It was a cold wind. It kicked up the dust and you breathed dust. bit into it. The old man kept peering straight ahead. And every now and then he changed the direction. Swing a little to the right, son. It's an old castle trail. We follow it for five miles or so. He knew the way perfect. It's Crescent Rock way up there ahead. Just keep it head on. We didn't detour or backtrack once. It's another ten miles now. Distance is pretty tricky out here. Things look closer than they really are. And then, just as it began to get near dawn, the sky was all smoky and you could start seeing the scrub weeds and cactus growing around the trail. Sykes grabbed my arm and said... Well, pull up here, son. Walk the rest of the way to the cave. I don't want anybody snooping around while we're down there with those machines. I don't want anyone to know a thing until I'm ready to tell them. Just about another hundred feet or so to be at the entrance to the room, son. Oh. Boy, I never knew how, how much this torch weighed till I had it strapped to my back. Sure, I can't give you a hand with it. No, 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 it's okay, Professor. Don't, don't worry. Over there, that's, that's all that's left of the place where I used to camp at night. I was afraid to sleep in the room, afraid to sleep outside the cleft. I used to make a fire and bed down on the rock. Can't say I... I'd enjoy that over a long period of time. <laughs> Get used to anything if it's important enough. They got used to the dark, the sound of little animals scurrying around, the damp, the smell. Wait. Huh? This is it, Kemp. You can take off your pack here. Uh, here. Oh. oh, that feels better. Oh, I'm glad I can still straighten up. You see that place there? Between the two pillar formations. That's it, son. And it's all yours. If that 300 years in the future torch of yours is any good, now's the time to prove it. You are listening to another thrilling adventure on the exciting new science fiction series, Beyond Tomorrow. In a moment, we'll return to our story. And 
now, back to our story. Okay. Now, now stand clear of the equipment, Professor. Sure that tank is balanced squarely? You can pile a few more rocks around it. Yeah, well, we'll give it a try this way. If it starts to move, just give a shot. I'll watch it, Tim. Well, here we go. Oh, how long do you think it'll take, Tim? I don't know. It depends on how thick the rock is that's sealing up this room. Tim, think of it. On this little piece of wire, I have a complete record of the movement of the polar glacier, which will have all the learned busybodies gnashing their teeth. But have I said anything? Not me. Not Sykes. And I'll wait till I can get the whole spool of wire, and I'll translate it into a history of the earth and mankind written in such detail, with such detail, with such authority, that the name of Sykes will go into the language as a synonym of the miraculously accurate. Me, Alessandro Sykes. Uh, hand me those black goggles, huh? How, how long have we been at it now, Professor? Almost three uh, hours, son. You better let me spare you. No, I'll, I'll take a breather when I need one. This torch is too heavy for you to handle. By the way, whatever happened to the entrance you used before? How can we have to burn our way in like this? You met my boys an unforeseen quality of the machines. For some reason, they closed themselves up. In a way, I'm glad they did. I wasn't able to get back in. I was forced to concentrate on my sample. If it hadn't been for that, I, I doubt I would ever have cracked the code. Whoever left these machines here, how they operate, we may never know. It would be interesting to find out. The important thing now is to get into that room and get that spool of wire. That's all that matters, son. That's all that matters. <laughs> Six hours and only seven and a half inches. I've seen that torch of mine walk in a laminated bank vaults like the door was open. What, what kind of rock is this, anyhow? There must have been some chemical substance added that we don't know about when the room was sealed. And you think that machine will still be running after the blast of heat it must have took to build this wall? It'll be running. They'll both be running. The recorder and the transmitter. What do you mean? The transmitter. Because the recorder was set to trip it off. I found that out, too. There's a little gear train waiting by the wire, and when something happened somewhere on Earth that was just the right thing, a crimp would show in the wire which would hit the gear train and start up the transmitter. Yes, but you said... I saw a crimp in the wire. Something happened which put a wiggle in it, the thing I was looking for all along. I was in the cave the day it happened. There was a sharp click... The transmitter started up and the wire kept on recording. I looked in the papers the next week to see what it was. I couldn't find a thing. It wasn't until the following August that I found out. What? What was the date when it started to transmit? July 16, 1945. July 16th. The day the first atom bomb was exploded at Los Alamos, New Mexico. <laughs> Okay. Okay, Professor. Oh, hold the light a little higher. This, this, they should do it now. edges cool. Thirty years work. Thirty years, Kim. Professor. Who who do you think's on the receiving end of that transmitter? I don't know. I'm only sure whoever he is or they are, they're not any place on this earth. That's why I've been so anxious to get into the room. Yeah, well, we'll throw that 
atlas over the edges. Just to be safe. You, you take the big flashlight. I'll bring the lamp. We can remove the spool of wire and then destroy the machines. It won't be any good to anyone else once the recording device is disconnected. Uh, the light, Kemp, bring in the light quickly. Yeah, quickly. Yeah, I'm right behind you, Professor. Uh, oh, brother. You, you weren't kidding about that machinery, were you? They're beautiful, aren't they, Kim? I've never seen anything that looks like that transmitter. And the recorder, Kim. Come closer. Examine the recorder. Listen to it humming, Kim. I knew it would be humming. It's recording everything that's happening to the Earth, the whole Earth, when we stand here and listen to it humming. Professor, maybe we better get the wire and get out of here. This place gives me the willies. Don't be frightened, son. Machines can't hurt you. It's not the machines. I, I just don't like this place. Let me hold the flashlight and you disconnect the school. There should be a catch lever of some sort which frees it. Uh, something like a movie camera, one of those old-fashioned wire recorders. Yeah, well, maybe I can find it, Professor. I, I've worked with these things. No, I know. No, I, I can find it. Just, just let me alone. <laughs> you forget that I've been... Oh, Cam. Cam. What's the matter, Professor? Cam. The reel is empty. Look. It's only eight inches of wire on it. Only eight inches, Cam. It was almost full before the cave was seen. That's it. No one could get through that rock. No one, I tell you. The reel's been refilled. That's what's happened. It's been refilled. Came. They've been here. Who? Who's been here, Professor? <laughs> That's what the transmitter was for, Ken. Tell them when the first atomic power was used on Earth. The recorder trip, the transmitter, it sent out a signal. They answered it and came here and changed the reel. <laughs> It's the beginning of a new era, as far as they're concerned. Sykes. Sykes. Who are you talking about? Who who are they? What do you mean? I don't know. I don't know, but they've been here. And I've lost 30 years' work. 30 years of my life completely gone, disappeared. (laughs) Professor, you've got to pull yourself together. We've got to get out of here. I don't like this at all. Get out? Why get out? Damage has been done now. The reel's gone. I don't like the way that that thing hums. Sounds like it's just sitting there waiting and... The crimp. It hit another crimp and the wire the transmitter started again. Doesn't matter now. Nothing matters now. Nothing. Nothing. Come on and grab that light. I've had enough of this place. No, no, I'm going to stay here. You're not staying in this stay cave. Here. You're coming with me if I have to carry you. No, no, let me alone. Come on. I'm staying here, Kim. Kim, let go of me. No, no. Let go. Uh, Professor, watch out for that recorder. Uh, Professor. Sykes, Sykes, are you all right? My hands. Burn my hands. It's so hot. Yes, yes, yes. Both of us. You're getting hotter every second. Come on, come on. we got to move. Something tells me this, this place is going to blow sky high. My hands. Put your arm across my shoulder. I'll guide you out through the cliff. Air school. 30 years work. Stop talking and walk, Professor. We're getting out of here and fast. I, I don't remember much about that climb up through the cliff. Dragging Sykes with me every inch of the way. I just knew it was hot. I could hear rock falling and rock bubbling thick and heavy behind me down there in that terrible room. I, I somehow got to the car and stretched Sykes out of the back seat. I asked him how he was, but he, he didn't answer me. He just kept looking back towards the cleft and the glow of the lava. And then he, he whispered... They knew we'd reached the atomic age. They wanted to be told when. That's what the transmitter did. They came and took the recordings and filled the machine. Don't, don't try to talk, Professor. I'm going to drive you into town and we'll get the doctor to take care of those hands of yours. 
They sealed off the room with something they thought only controlled atomic power could break into. This time the recorder was triggered to that power. Your, your, your torch did it, Kemp. <laughs> that 300 years in the future torch that did it. They think we have atomic power. They'll come back, Kemp. Who, oh, Professor? Who? Oh. I don't know. I don't know whether they're friends or enemies or where they are. There'd be only one reason why someone, some creature, would want to know a thing like that. And that's so they could stop us. Oh, no, no, Professor. We're not going to be stopped now. Like the papers say, we're in the atomic age if it kills us. Mm. But we're in for keeps. Why, humanity would have to be killed off before to get out of this atomic age. I know that, Kim. I know. That's what I mean. Oh, Kim. Kim, what have we done? What have we done? Professor? Professor Sykes? <laughs> I was going to bury him there, out there near the cleft. I thought he'd like to be there. But then I, I realized that people would be wondering about him, looking for him. So I brought him in. In the excitement, I left town. It, it just didn't look good to me. I knew nobody would listen to a yarn like that. <coughs> well, <clears throat> now I can see what Brother Kemp was worried about. And that story is true. I, for one, would think twice about telling him. He's a liar. He's a murder liar. I got a kid that reads that kind of stuff, and I never did like to see him at it. Believe me, he's going to cut it out as of right now. I think this Kemp guy needs a hang out. Oh, wait a minute, man. Wait a minute. If we kill off this fellow, we do it legal, see? You just keep quiet a while longer and let me ask this boy a question. Now, uh, look, Kemp. If there's anything in your story... Or in that goofy idea of the dead man's about someone coming to kill us off. Well, ain't it about time they did? <laughs> yeah! Yeah! When's the invasion start, Kim? Yeah, maybe we should start digging foxholes now, huh, Kim? <laughs> I didn't say anything about that. I just told you the facts the way they happened. I just told you what Sykes told me. The whole thing's a lousy pack of lies. It's all lies. Lies! Wilson! Wilson! That was a bomb! Ed Wilson, look! There! In the sky! Look! Ships! Ships! The sky is full of ships! have just heard Incident at Switchpath, another program in the new science fiction series, Beyond Tomorrow. Michael O'Day was featured in the role of James Kent, and Brett Marson was heard as Professor Sykes. Music was composed and conducted by Henry Silburn, and John Campbell, Jr. was our technical consultant. Beyond Tomorrow was produced and directed by Mitchell Grayson. Listen again next week at the same time for another story about you in the future. You, Beyond Tomorrow.